Te Ohoranga Tira, Tenakoto Katoa. We acknowledge that there is a strength beyond ourselves when we work together to serve others. May we put aside our own personal interests, work with integrity and openness, striving to create a community that supports its people and the environment. Let us, in a moment of quiet, focus on why we're here. We give thanks for the wisdom of the past, look for opportunities in the present, and accept the challenges of the future. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this council meeting. Can I just advise everybody that this meeting is being uh, recorded both audio and visually. So just to remind me that I should be on my best behaviour. Um, so we have apologies today from the chief executive. I think all councillors are here. Um, so uh, we will just accept that. We don't need to move that. Um, as the Chief Executive, but, but welcome Antoinette Campbell, who's the Acting Chief Executive. Are there any conflicts of interest? There's not. We move on to the public forum, and we have with us Craig Waterhouse. Craig, you know the rules. Five minutes, <laughs> and uh, the clock starts ticking now. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, PGA, as you all are aware, is in Taradol. It was set up uh, as a combination between Napier, Hastings Council and EIT. And our objectives, very, very clear, provide public indoor recreational facility for furtherance of physical wellbeing for the people of Hawke's Bay. But we rent space. We do not run programs. We provide a facility for that to happen. OK, so uh, I think I'll skim through this because you all know probably from the past of what we do. We've got Subway in there. Their rent's probably doubled in the last five years because of the way uh, they've run a very successful <coughs> business. We've tried to move to a standalone 24-hour gym um, and uh, we have regular users. And the Hawks Basketball, Keith said I had to put that up first, uh, is a major tenant, Hawks Bay Basketball, Hawks Bay Futsal and Volleyball Hawks Bay. And we have a little bit of net in Badminton. Those are our major users. If you ever go down to Wellington, you'll find some sports played indoor that you have never heard of uh, uh, in terms of their activity. So there's plenty of opportunity for other sports. And we've had a bit of um, uh, pats of tennis, as I call it. What's it called now? The pat of tennis? Pickleball. Pickleball is uh, being played there during the day. OK, uh, community use, and this is a biggie for us. Uh, uh, we guarantee community users eight weeks of a term, which means they can uh, uh, have a program. They've got security of users using the place. Um, so if we get a commercial booking, uh, unlike what we used to do, we don't kick a regular user out. We may negotiate with them, but we don't remove them. Um, we've doubled the community use in the last four years by expanding the hours they use it and including Friday night. Uh, it was ne never used before and demanding that if they're going to use it, they actually use the facility. Previously, we have had a regular user rent for two hours to avoid losing the night, so we don't allow any of those practices anymore. And our only pricing increase that we've done in the last four, five years relates to inflation, so uh, we're quite good in that regard. In four years, we've, ch we've saved both councils a million dollars in reducing the operating grants. We were uh, losing a massive amount of money and being propped up by the councils before you restructured the entity. Um, our community use has basically peaked. We've got no more opportunity or space. Um, effectively, in four years, we've had a $2.4 million turnaround. We've got $1.4 million in the bank account waiting for our expansion. Um, Last year, we stopped the gym decline. That's been a major problem for us, where the competition and location on the outskirts of town have resulted in a significant drop-off in gyms as the significant number of gyms. I mean, five years ago, we were the only gym in Caradale. There's now two gyms. We've sorted out our balance sheet and our capital expenditure. Uh, we're very tight on capital expenditure. Those around the council table that know me, uh, we will not allow any capital expenditure if it's not approved by the board. That way, it doesn't get out of control. 
Um, there's our revenue for last year, the, the year before, and what our budget is. And as you can see, uh, last year and the year before, we made uh, before depreciation in excess of 300k. We're still losing money, uh, but we've got quite disciplined in that. Uh, if you saw uh, the last graph down the bottom, our fixed assets, asset investment last year was 400k, and just about all of that was funded externally by applications and grants. Um, our projects that we currently got on is uh, we're trying to build a standalone gym entrance that will allow it to be 24 hours and then it may be allow us to sell that business. Um, we need new operational office as space has been used inside. We've got additional exits for safety reasons upstairs, an extension of the meeting room area upstairs we're going to build over the squash courts and that should allow indoor bowls. We're currently negotiating with indoor bowls in Onikawa for them to move to our facility. Um, we've replaced all the upstairs stadium seating uh, due to us running out of that type of seating. The uh, people that sold it to us no longer make it, and we've up replaced all the stadium glass upstairs, which was a quite a substantial cost, but glass is supposed to shatter, and when a futsal ball went into it, uh, luckily there was no one underneath it because uh, large chunks of glass came out, so we have to replace the whole lot. Uh, Keith's making us get new basketball hoops, and... Um, We've also got the uh, major uh, need for additional court space. Uh, our stadium extension, which you all know about, uh, hopefully, five to six courts. Uh, location is the thing that's holding us up there. We've got two choices, and we're just working through that with Wayne, um, and hopefully we'll have an answer within three months. Um, we've completed the feasibility study on that project. Car parking's a bit of an issue, but if we can find the solution we want over the riverbank, that's five minutes, OK. Right, uh, issues, stadium, slow pace of development, potential for shortfall in funds without HDC support and long-term car parking is an issue. That's it. Thank you very much, Craig. And can I congratulate you on the work you've done over the recent times. It has been a massive turnaround. The whole place was just a massive headache for, for councils and it's now turned into an asset which we can all enjoy. So thank you for your good works. Councillor, any questions of, of Craig? Councillor Tarpany and Councillor Boat. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is around, as you guys are primarily in the business of space, what has happened to shift you from your previous community use to now peak scenario situation? Uh, previous community here? use really was a problem. Okay. So they previous board or management took commercial bookings ahead of community use. Okay. We don't do that. The only community program that we really ran before was the kindy gym. And our revenue in four years had never exceeded the fixed cost. And it wasn't run any, every day. So we really said, what business are we in? We're in the business of renting space, but community use first. So the community user had stopped using Friday night because they got sick, sick and tired of being bumped for uh, commercial bookings. So we said, well, we'll sort that. So we sorted that. And we identified the other issues that a regular user had. And that was, we need eight weeks to run a program. So we said, we'll commit to that. So we've turned around and, and we are a community use facility that they've got guaranteed tenancy. They didn't have that before. So you imagine running a basketball program and suddenly some commercial user says, I want to have a concert here. So we've lost a bit of revenue as a result, but you can run your community program or your, your basketball program now, whereas you would have had trouble before. And there's no alternative. You can't use our facility. You can't go down the road. Well, yep. Councillor Boat. Thank you. Um, yes, congratulations for turning this all around. Um, you said there was no support or little support from the Hastings District Council. Is that the case? Are they, yeah, they won't put any money into the expansion at the moment. But they do put money in. Yes, they put otherwise. the exactly same amount of money in as you, and I think the user ratio is about 35, 65 that we've calculated. In their defence, I must say that the Hastings District Council have said that they will consider putting in the same amount as us at a later date, but they can't budget for it at the moment because the cost they're put, putting into their, into their water issues. Thank you. 
Any further questions? Councillor Taylor. Obviously a difficult one, Craig, but congratulations. But you, you say you're in the business of renting space. The contingency of Sport Hawks Bay, who are a major tenant, were to move to the regional sports, relocate to the regional sports park. What opportunities do you see for that um, office space to be re to rented to another? Uh, we looked at a number of scenarios, uh, shared office space. Um, the most logical is EIT. So we've had lots of discussions with EIT and we were probably going quite nicely. The government uh, changing the fee structure to a free first year, they needed more space this year. Um, so we're continuing to have discussions with them. It's about, well, I don't know how far away it is and I guess EIT will, sorry, Sports Hawks Bay will decide um, what they want to do, they may not wish to re even negotiate a new tenancy on the basis that um, they have the opportunity to eventually go to the sports park. But the cost of the sports park, I'm told, is about twice the price that we are. Sports Hawks pay no, make no contribution to operating costs. Um, so it's a pretty good low cost rent, but we recognise that we're not going to get another tenant fall over and pay. Um, we, we want about $100,000 out of that space, including operating costs, but we get more than that out of EIT as their contribution towards operating costs. Any further questions? Well, thank you very much, Craig. Yes, Most informative and uh, all the best in the future. Okay. Well, they seem to be here by Thursday. Um, Announcements by the Mayor. Just one, councillors. Um, we sent out a note the other day just asking for those who are interested in going to conference. There are so far three have uh, said they are interested. Um, as you know, we send two. Um, if there's any more, you need to get in by uh, this week because we will just do a draw for those ones that uh, to send the two. So I just remind you if you if you are interested. Um, and, and Richard, your suggestion before is not a good idea. Um, I mean, that's not a telling off. Richard, Richard suggests he would put his name in the hat and if he's drawn, he would s sell his place in the queue, but... Um, put it towards the War Memorial. I, I think it's a good entrepreneurial idea. <laughs> Any announcements by management? No announcements by management. Confirmation of the minutes, the draft minutes of the ordinary meeting of council held on Tuesday 11th of December be true and correct. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Wright. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. The, the draft minutes of the extraordinary meeting of Council held on Thursday the 20th December be confirmed. Councillor Price, Councillor Haig. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. That the draft minutes of the extraordinary meeting of Council held on Friday the 8th of February 2019 be confirmed as true and accurate. Moved by Councillor Dallymore, seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. We move on to agenda item one, which is the supplementary report on the War Memorial design. Do we have a mover for this? I'm happy to move that we note those points. Thank you. You move, you note the points. Do you think it should, because it's a, uh, a little controversial and the wording has changed, would the councillors like that new wording read out? Uh, th that's, oh, that's, that's further yeah. on. Oh, that's the, the next one. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is the next one. Yeah. Mr Mayor, we could take the item that was brought to the committee at the same time as this one. Would you like us to take them both together? I, th I think that makes sense. They actually, yeah. they actually do relate to each other and mm. so... Um, so we'll take the two of them together. You've got the council officer's recommendation. The other one, which comes out of the um, strategy and infrastructure meeting, is item uh, six on page 74 of your document. So we're considering the, the council officer's report uh, or recommendation and the uh, recommendation that was put before the strategy and and infrastructure committee as one item. So you would like to move that? I'm happy to move both. Yeah, move both as a joint item, seconded by Councillor Wise. For both? Right. Yeah. And um, no, it's th good. through you, Mr Mayor, what I'm moving, I'm happy to read out. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I am moving that the Council A consider the community feedback 
B reconfirms its decision made on the 27th of September 2017 to locate the war memorial at the floral clock site and C provides direction on a design concept. D, that council staff take the following direction to create a revised community-led concept for adoption by council. One, that the reinstated memorial be constructed at forecourt level on the floral clock site, forming part of the war memorial site. Two, that a curved wall open to the elements, reflective of the ballroom shape and physically connected to the building, display the role of honour. Three, that the perpetual flame form part of the existing War Memorial building entrance so that it is visible when entering the building from the memorial and externally at night. Four, that water be incorporated into the design that is near to and complements the flame so that they may be viewed together. Five, that a place to sit or places to sit and reflect be included. Six, that physical access and visual connection to the formal lawn be incorporated. Seven, that remembrance artwork be incorporated into the design to connect the memorial space with the memorial building and lower lawn, uniting the memorial elements. Eight, that landscaping is included that complements um, and promotes restful contemplation and unites the memorial building with the memorial elements. Nine, that the design include flagpoles connecting the memorial and memorial building. Seven, that World War One and World War, oh, sorry, ten, <laughs> that World War One and World War Two roles be displayed in a prominent way, flowing on to consecutive conflicts roles. Eleven, that the physical original role of honour be respectfully incorporated into the design and that a small committee of appropriate representatives are given this brief to provide council on a recommendation on how to incorporate. E. Note council's intention to tender the development of a revised concept no later than August 2019 and tender construction as soon as practicable in the 2019 calendar year. F notes Council's existing budget for the project and provides guidance for the purpose of tendering that construction costs, excluding all professional fees, to be up to $750,000. Moved. Thank you. Any questions, any comments, councillors? Through you, Mr Mayor, may I speak to it first? Yep. Thank you. Um, so this has been a long process but a worthy one with the result that we have in front of us, a community-led design. In adopting this, we have taken a true in-depth look at the themes and the important elements that our community talked to us about in their submissions. This resolution puts the memorial elements back to their rightful place on the memorial site. This has a number of similarities to the 1957 original, with the role being open on an open curved wall and attached to the building. The flame is connected with the entrance so that all building users will pass by it, and it has created space that allows not only for respectful connectivity but also restful contemplation. This is a success and I am proud to bring it to you here today for discussion. There have been a number of small changes to the wording to align with our arts policy, to be accurate in our intent, to address minor wording concerns elected members had, and to add certainty for our staff in the next stage of tendering. I support these minor changes as they add to our resolution's intent, not detract from them. Thank you to everyone here and the elected members for their support in allowing this resolution to unify us with our community on this issue which has been so divisive. Thank you. Could I just ask management the timetable? Is that realistic? I don't know whether John or Antoinette you want to answer that, but is, is the realist, is the, is the timetable we're putting this realistic? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, uh, the first statement of E, no council's intention to tender the development of a revised concept no later than August. If that revised concept is about design, then we can tender that by no later than August. Uh, however, with regard to tender construction as soon as practical in the 2019 calendar year, uh, I do not believe it's practically achievable. 
if we were to reword that as uh, soon as practical in the 2019-20 financial year, then we can do that. Are you happy for that to be changed to that? I, th I think that that is fine because as soon as practical is still in there, so that may very well be this calendar year, but I'm happy for that to be the financial year if that... Um, is the seconder happy with that? Yeah. All right, so we'll just amend that wording if we can. Thank you for that clarification. Is there any further discussion or questions? Well, Councillor Jeffrey. Just what, uh, through you, Mr Chair, what sort of budget, Councillor Brosman, did you see for the... A remembrance artwork that's going to be incorporated. It certainly can't come out of the construction costs. No, so um, council has a budget of 1.5 million set aside in our um, in our in our long-term plan, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, so. I envision that 750,000 additional buffer being enough to, to um, allow for the commissioning of that artwork. I, I don't know what that artwork will look like, so I can't give you a budget for it. Well, usually we've allowed 5 to 10 per cent of budget for artwork that we try and incorporate with, uh, you know, with projects. So that's sort of a, a ballpark sort of figure. You certainly wouldn't want to spend the... the uh, the, the entire 750 residual no. on public artwork. No, I think Antoinette may like to comment. She gave context around forming it into the original um, concept design stage rather than leaving it as I had originally proposed to after design. Um, but I think you had some advice around how we could incorporate that into the tendering. Yeah, it is um, preferable to um, include it in the design brief, that artistic elements be incorporated to the design rather than an add-on and a separate tender after the fact. There is a policy for that. That, 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 that is does, council policy. That is, yeah. is council policy, yes. and we've yes. done it very successfully with the marine parade redevelopments, yes. with the PO and the etchings, and also with the Anderson Park playground, with the um, with Rick's two Stappens artworks that were incorporated into into yeah. the design too. This has to be right, and I'd say that at least ten percent of budget is probably appropriate because you know it's very important that we get those elements in there. Um, through the Chair, just a point of clarification, it was my understanding that cost of artwork was going to be separate to the construction cost. Yeah, it is, it is, that's it what is, I'm saying. Um, but it is being included in tender document, which would tend to suggest that the $750,000 would then include the cost of the artwork. So just clarifying, is that that's not the case? Or? Um, if I could be helpful through you, Mr Chair, if we put excluding um, the remembrance artwork and all professional fees, I think then it's covered in the in point F. We'll just work it into the design yeah, brief. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, I'm quite happy for that amendment that Councillor Jeffrey is proposing. That in, in the brackets of F, it's excluding remembrance artwork and all professional fees. Yep. Thank happy you. with that. Second. Yep. yep. So take that. Right. Any other questions? Any other comments, Councillor McGrath? Yeah, can I just seek clarification from Council? There's been a uh, bits and pieces online that uh, Council are lining the War Memorial up to sell, either to the hotel or to whoever, some private conference facility or what have you. Can Council give some certainty that it is not going to sell the land or the building? You should never believe what you read online, Councillor McGrath. I'm not believing it, I'm seeking <laughs> clarification to confirm I don't it. think even if we were of a mind to, okay. we have any ability whatsoever to sell it, and rest assured we are not of a mind to ever sell that. Um, it's, uh, it requires an it's, it's actually, I think, in a special type of reserve, and, and, yeah. and, and it would take an act of Parliament, I think, to, uh, to change its status. Yep. Huh? Any other questions? Well, I've got one. I note, Councillor Brosnan, that in your War Memorial proposal, it says that the Council should consider the community feedback, and in that feedback, only one person asked for flagpoles, and that they're included in your brief, and other than those who supported the Guy Tush proposal, very few asked for the memorial to be at forecourt level. So my question is, do you believe Council has considered the community feedback, and do you believe that your design is truly community-led? 
thank you for your question. Yes, I do. I think that um, if you look at the feedback we received on a purely um, quantitative spectrum, so you look at tick boxes, yes or no, whether they liked a particular option, um, then you would come to that conclusion, Your Worship. However, if you look at the particular comments like I did and went through everyone that um, talked about why they liked a particular option and why they disliked a particular option, you will see that people who liked the forecourt level and the uh, the, for, the forecourt option and the, the tens and tens of comments around that was about its connectivity to the site. So, um, and, and, and conversely, the ones who didn't like the garden option was about making it feel separate to the site and it not being, um, not recognising that the whole site is memorial and that you need to, as part of using the memorial buildings, understand that you are in a memorial. So by, um, if you looked purely at the numbers around those who supported, say, the forecourt option, then you would say, do we have community support for a forecourt level design? However, when I analysed the submissions and when I brought that to you, um, I have gone deeper than that and looked at the content of the comments and what they are trying to achieve. And my, this is this is my interpretation of that. Yeah, and it is an interpretation. And, and, and congratulations for the work you've done. I have no problem with that at all. Councillors, you'll know that when this proposal first came to us at the strategy and infrastructure meeting, I was the only one to vote against it. However, within minutes, I had councillors approaching me, unhappy with what was presented and how it was presented. Not, a, not even a sketch to know what it would look like, no costings at all, and no resemblance to what the public told us they wanted. I believe springing such a proposal on council without preserving it or presenting it to a workshop first was simply wrong and I voted accordingly. However, since that meeting, the proposer has wisely spent considerable time with staff and senior councillors and the proposal is now in a form I can accept. However, I do so with some reluctance. Councillors around this table will remember that it is they who set the criteria for the very expensive and exhaustive public consultation process we undertook. We went out with three options and twice as many submitters supported the garden or landscape option as supported the next most popular option. Like me, the public preferred the garden option, but council is clearly of a mind to deliver them something else, despite the clear steer from the public. Councillors, this project has already been delayed enough by the small lobby group that has been determined to get their own way, and their way has constantly changed direction. Initially, they lobbied to have the memorial elements returned inside the building. When they realised that wasn't going to happen, they got in behind the Natush proposal. Then one of them came up with a crazy, uncosted, impractical idea, again, to return the memorial elements inside the building, and they supported that. Every time the lobby group changed directions, their numbers dwindled to the point that it now appears that this proposal is promoted by a very small number indeed. Some around this table believe that demonstrates public support. But I will accept this proposal so that our role of honour can be put in place as soon as possible. Having said that, I believe the timeline in this proposal is totally unrealistic, but that now has been changed since I made these notes. But you can't expect an already overworked staff to deliver on these notes. In any case, this project is going out to tender and we have to find someone who wants to tender on a project that has become so controversial. We will be in their hands. And I ask you, what can Council do if the timeline can't be or isn't met? Better than me, You'll have no option. You'll be gone. <laughs> Finally, when the new role of honour has been completed, I hope Council, and I will be well and truly gone, will have the guts to follow the clear example shown by the Hastings and District War Memorial Library, the Clive War Memorial Swimming Pool, the Taradale War Memorial Plunket Rooms, and many others around the district and country, and rename the entire complex 
the Napier War Memorial Conference Centre. It is first and foremost a war memorial, but since before the turn of the century, it has also undeniably been a conference centre. Thank you. So is there any more comments about Councillor Taylor? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to just do a couple, make a couple of comments. Firstly, around flagpoles. I noted, going back through my seminar um, information, that in June last year, when we were considering plinths and signs in front of the, the building, included in that were flagpoles. So we ourselves were going to incorporate flagpoles at that facility. So the fact that a submitter has put flagpoles in, I don't see that as uh, succumbing to a pressure or one person. We ourselves, we're actually going to do it when we looked at those options it. and we decided whether it would be in the middle of the plinth or to the left of the plinth or the right. So we were going to put flagpoles there right from the start. But I would like to say that back in 2016, we made a serious error of judgment, naivety by some councillors, or what? That we were going to agree to remove the perpetual flame and the role of honour and allow it to be relocated, possibly to Civic Square or other places. Since then, and using some military terminologies, we have had numerous skirmishes and battles, and these have occurred around the name and the returning of the perpetual flame and the role of honour. Late last year, we produced a consultation document for the purpose of seeking feedback on options for the Napier War Memorial design. In that document, we stated a new purpose-built memorial returning the memorial elements will be located on the Napier War Memorial Centre site, and that will include the perpetual flame and revised role of honour. We sent out three options, and I've looked at these carefully, and I think I said in the committee meeting, we can't pick and choose what we want to highlight. We talked about a garden option on the site of the floral clock. We talked about a forecourt building option, an enclosed building on the forecourt, and an indoor option. And we stated, for our ratepayers and people to provide your feedback on and you can share your design ideas. 1,300 people submitted and put their ideas forward. 845 approximately, or 65%, suggested the garden option on the floral clock site. And as I said previously in the committee meeting, the actual Florida clock is higher, goes higher at the top of its point than the forecourt. So, you know, it's on the forecourt side. I would just like us to say that we ask the public to submit. We have got their submission. We should now include those submissions. And Councillor Brosnan has completed a comprehensive analysis of the submission and has formulated a truly community-led design. She should be congratulated for her work. Yeah, yeah. This is not a design constructed by councillors, as some in the media would like to suggest. This is not a design of any particular interest group. This is designed by the community, and I congratulate you. Anybody else like to comment? Councillor Wise, surprise me. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't Could be the opposite to me. Mouth shut. <laughs> um, this indeed has been an incredibly long journey for all of us, and um, I truly believe today's resolution takes us another step closer to the restoration of our war memorial. Not a new memorial, but the respectful reinstatement of the role of honour and perpetual flame to the building and site which was dedicated to our fallen soldiers in 1957. In September last year, myself and several other councillors attended a public meeting called by members of our community who wanted to give the wider community an opportunity to truly engage and have input into the design of our war memorial. Attended by approximately 150 people, it was very clear that everyone present had strong views on what they thought was the best design. 
However, there was also an acknowledgement by all that the final design needed to be a combination of all of the community's views and not just their own. It needed to truly be a community-led design. I believe the resolution before us today does exactly that. It takes the best features as identified by our community from each of the three consultation design concepts and pulls them together. And most importantly, it recognises that the building and a whole site are key elements of the memorial, along with the role of honour and perpetual flame. Concern has been expressed that the cost of the new design concept is unknown. However, most of the components are included in the costings prepared for the three consultation design concepts. Based on my analysis of these costings, I am confident that the budget of 1.5 million is more than adequate for the design direction we are proposing. So once again, I would like to say a huge thank you to councillors and staff alike for uh, remaining open-minded throughout this process and providing our community with this opportunity. It is unlike anything else we, we have done before and I think it's a huge step forward in the way that we're engaging with our community. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to the key stakeholders for their patience, uh, for the significant contributions they've made and for also recognising that this is something we've all had to make compromises on and work together to achieve a final result. And um, of course, lastly, the, the 1,300 um, people that did make submissions to the consultation process who it gave us the feedback to, to pull together this design brief. A design we can all proudly say um, has well and truly been led by our community. Thank you, Councillor Wise. Our rules require us, after we've had three speakers, either for or against, to uh, put the motion, but first I need to ask, is there anybody who wishes to speak against the motion before us? Don't forget, it's effectively a combined motion of the two, two items. So if no one wants to speak against it... Can I have write a reply? I was just going to say, if no one wants to speak against it, I'll invite Councillor Brosnan to have her right of reply. Thank you very much. I'll make it very short. So I just wanted to reiterate, um, as, as um, Graham, Councillor Taylor said, that um, I believe we have an absolute mandate behind this resolution. Um, you know, the, the public preferred the garden option 60%, as Your Worship said, but 69% did not. So I, I believe there is absolutely a mandate for a combined approach. Um, in voting for this resolution, we are saying we not only listened, but we analysed, we looked deep, we gave this issue its due consideration, and we collaborated on an option that puts right these wrongs. Lest we forget, and we did forget. Today, we joined together, we put them first, and we remember. Thank you. So... I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Sorry? They were definitely in, weren't they? Yes. Yep, both those present. changes were in. Perfect. Yeah. The, the proposer and second are happy with that. Yes. Both those changes were in. Yeah. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Right, item two, Hawke's Bay Disaster Relief Trust. The uh, people in the gallery are very welcome to leave now if they wish. So we move on to the Hawke's Bay Disaster Relief Trust, uh, moved by Councillor Taylor. This one's an absolute no-brainer. Seconded by Councillor Wright. Any discussion to the motion? Uh, yeah, I think that's what the two There's not. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. The um, uh, item three, another no-brainer, uh, updated external policies. It's just a matter of tidying up. Um, <coughs> Our, our policies which are being constantly reviewed. Um, through, you, through you, yep. Mr Mayor. Um, I'm happy to move B and C, but I have some comment on A, if that's all right. Right. So we'll take comments and so on before we get to moving the motion because it might be different. Okay. 
Um, so very happy with B and C. Um, a around Lagoima. I had a really good read through this, and this is an area I have a particular um, interest or knowledge on. Um, I manage that act for this council, um, or, or one of the ones who do. And um, I just think as a public-facing document, it needs a little bit more work. I'd, I'd like it to more, um, you know, it's got some it's got some administration issues in there, um, but it also, you know, as a public-facing policy around Lagoima, I think it should more be tailored to, you know, what's your role, what's our role, what does the Act say, here are potential costs, timeframes, that sort of thing. I think um, it gets lost in the middle, and I just think could we lay it on the table is my personal view so that someone has a bit of time to look at it, just because it's not getting double debated. I don't think there's any room in the middle there for amendments to be made. Speak please. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, because La Goima is so, so um, official information act. Sorry for the record. Um, are such a heavily legislated area, um, and as you'll be aware, um, there are strong guidelines that come out of the Office of the Ombudsman as well. Um, in this instance, we've deliberately pulled the policy back up to a higher level because on our website we have the procedural matters captured under an information page that people would be accessing in order to make the request. Um, directly into council anyway. So sorry, that sounded a bit convoluted. But there is a very specific area um, in our website which people would access in order to make the requests, in order um, to find out about the procedure, um, any potential charges, um, things that they may want to think about. Um, so we've deliberately kept the policy at a higher level rather than procedural. If I could if ask, a, uh, ask a question, um, I'm obviously familiar with the Act. Why do we need a policy? Because mm, part of this policy is pretty much regurgitating the Act. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, that's an excellent question. Um, this is a legacy policy. We did, um, we did consider repealing it at the time of review. Um, it was decided um, at that point that perhaps pulling it up to the higher level um, may be an interim option at this point, but if Council is comfortable that this area is heavily procedural and guided by the Acts, then repeal may be an option. Yeah, that's, my, that's probably my preference after your um, conversation. Thank you. My view is that because the, to be honest, the, because it's at such a high level, it actually doesn't do any harm at all, and, and if the details on our site, I'd be very happy to leave it as it is. Would you be happy for that? Because it's at such a high level, mm. and you're asking about detail and the details on the site. Yeah, I think from a public-facing perspective, I'm very um, happy happy with the answer there. Um, I suppose I come back to the fact I don't, I'm not sure if we even need it. It doesn't add any value. Doesn't add any guidance to staff that's not in the no, act. Doesn't do any harm. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Any other comments? Right. Right, do we have a, sorry. Through the chair, um, I also had some concerns about this item. I, I don't, um, you know, there was a lot of detail that's been deleted, and um, and procedural, you know, the procedure, the principles, and for me, it was sort of like, whoa, where's this going? And so for me, I'm not like uh, Councillor Brosnan, I don't deal with this, um, I just see what comes through on some of our agendas. And so I didn't know where it came from, what we were doing, and so really for me, it was probably more information as to why it had landed and why we've got such a drastic change. I mean, virtually now it's gone from, you know, 50 lines to a, a dozen. And I think that's just been explained. The, the, yeah. the decision was to move it up to a higher level with the detail on the site. I mean, then, then you would have to. You know, it begs the question then: If you get down to a dozen lines, does it need to be there? Yeah. And, and maybe or, or does it do any harm? Any other comments? Oh, we've got a mover, please, for that. We haven't got a mover yet. We've got a mover. I'll move B and C. <laughs> Is there a mover for the whole lot? Yeah, I'll move them. Moved by Councillor Wright. I'll second them. Councillor by Councillor, second, Councillor by Councillor Taylor. <laughs> um, any further discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? No. Aye. Carried.
Do you want those? Um, oh, no, 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 no. Is it? Is it? Is that an automatic division? It is no. recorded against. Yeah. It'll be recorded against. Yeah. No. So, Councillor White, did you want yours recorded against or not? No. Yep. Oh. Councillor White and Brosnan. Right, the next one is the Hawke's Bay Museum's Trust Draft Settlement of Intent. Statement of Intent. Councillor White, would you like to move that? Yes, I'll move that. Is there a seconder? A seconder. Seconded by Councillor Wright. Is there any discussion to that uh, document? See, my wife's gone. I meant to ask her to get me some rock melon. Anyway, John, is there any discussion to that document? It's not. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. So item five is the Hawke's Bay Museum's Trust Half-Year Financial Report to the 31st December 2018. Again, moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Wright. I'm glad you two are here today. Um, is there any discussion to the motion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. We move on to reports and recommendations from the standing committees. Um, the reports from the Maori Consultative Committee have all been before us before, so they have been moved by Councillor Tuppany, seconded by Councillor Bogue. Any discussion to the motion? There's not. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. So the reports from the Audit and Risk Committee held on the 6th of December 2018. Item one is the Audit New Zealand Management Letter. Item two is the proposed Audit and Risk Committee 2019 meeting calendar. Item three is the Health and Safety Report. Item four is the Risk Management Report. And item five is the Internal Audit Program 2018-2019. Can I have somebody, do you like to move that, Councillor Wise, seconded by Councillor Haig. Any discussion to that? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Reports from the Napier Disability Strategy. This is the reports from the Strategy and Infrastructure Committee held on the 19th of February 2019. Uh, Napier Disability Strategy draft for consultation. Can I again just comment on that about the wonderful work that Natasha's done um, and the people that she's got around here? I think it's absolutely fantastic and it bodes well for a caring city, so well done. Um, item two is the Napier Sailing Funding Request. Item three is the representative Representation Review 2018 Local Government Commission Determination. Ordering of candidates' name on voting documents. Item five we've covered uh, in the previous... In the no, no. Oh, that's the Roll of Honour. Oh, oh, there you go. Nope, your Roll of Honour. Mr Mayor, I have some questions that I wouldn't mind asking staff about I think about you should that, do that. If that's right. Thanks, Charles. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, this is really just following up some concerns I had about the removal of the 15 names. Um, and I just wondered, Charles, firstly, could you just remind us of the criteria for being on the Roll of Honour, the key criteria for that? Absolutely, thank you, through you, Mr Chair. The uh, criteria, uh, as outlined in a June 29, uh, 29 June 2018 paper, is uh, the criteria is to be applicable within the physical boundaries of Greater Napier, from the Tuataikuri River as the southern boundary to the former Wairoa Borough Council boundary to the north. To be eligible, a person must either be born in Napier, enlisted in Napier, the next of kin resides in Napier, to have been employed in Napier, educated in Napier, and the church parish is in Napier. Uh, only those that died on active service at home or abroad are to be uh, commemorated. The time frame for death in service is to be in accordance with the New Zealand government dates from the official commencement date of the conflict to the official end date of that conflict. 
Thank you. And just following up on that, then, of the 15, I understand there are some who died after the wars and are buried elsewhere or in Napier. One in Wellington, I think, someone in Auckland. That's right. Can you just comment on the precedent we'd be setting if we left them on the roll rather than remove them? That's correct. Um, through the research, what came out as a surprise that we weren't expecting uh, was how late some of these return service people had, had actually um, become deceased. Uh, of the 15... Uh, Four of those people are from the World War I Roll of Honour, which is, was developed back in the 1950s. Uh, and nine of those 15 are from World War II. Five out of 11 died in the 1980s, uh, and they were well, in, <coughs> well into their 70s. Uh, one out of the 11 died in 1992, and the review was only conducted in 1994. Uh, one out of the 11 died in 1951. Uh, the person that died in 1951 is quite close to the end date of World War II. Uh, that person that died in 1951 uh, he was a private and drove an ambulance in the NZEF. He was a sergeant in the Home Guard in World War II, so he served in both world wars. Uh, he returned from the First World War late, uh, having served in France and Belgium for the War Graves Commission, and uh, he was presented with uh, a French Medal of Honour here in Napier for his work, basically. this person uh, went around the battlefields and reinterred Allied soldiers into war cemeteries. Uh, this person is the closest out of that 15 to the end date, whereas the others uh, in the 1980s through to 1992. Uh, the precedent that this sets really is in balance with the general feedback that was captured on this journey around what does it mean for others that returned and lived and contributed to Napier well into their old age but haven't been recognised uh, on a roll of honour. Uh, so that's the precedent it sets. Thank you. And I'm sorry to be labouring this, Mr Mayor, but I just feel it's really important we're really sure mm. about these 15. Um, so my next question is, I know it's been really difficult to track down some families. Can you, I gather that's because of the Privacy Act or some records have simply been lost? That's correct. Um, of the 15, there are five names uh, that... <coughs> uh, we are quite certain they do not, they're either not real names or uh, they have no association with Napier at all and have probably been identified through their departure vessel, uh, which was the Hawke's Bay. That was the name of the, the vessel. Uh, one of the 15, one family has come forward and confirmed that that person actually has not had, nor to the best of their knowledge, ever had any association with Napier. Uh, they voluntarily came forward through publicising uh, the list and they've asked for that name to be removed. Through uh, the Auckland War Memorial um, Cenotaph database, I have found one person who's actually registered information against their relative. Uh, since this report was prepared, I've heard back from that family and they've confirmed that to the best of their knowledge, uh, that person has not had any association with Napier and they're listed on the Oamaru Roll of Honour. Uh, Within, without publicising these names and using the uh, electronic database avenues that we've, our researchers have had access to, because of the privacy law, uh, the public access of information, we've not been able to track family members to th these other people. Uh, but short of going through the white pages, we could explore further. Uh, these names, with the exception of the one that's 
volunteered to be removed. Uh, we did not receive any uh, inquiry as to why those people weren't were not listed. Okay. And finally, if we make a mistake, you know, and subsequently find out we've made a mistake, what remedy would there be for the council to restore the name to the role of honour? How could we organise that? Uh, as we work through the detailed design phase and actually laying out the role of honour um, within the memorial design, we do need to consider space for additional names to be added. Uh, it's certainly achievable. Some rules will need to be wrapped around it and uh, policy and procedure needs to be wrapped around the ceremonial elements of the memorial anyway, in which we'd look to build that in. Uh, an example with the Hastings War Memorial Library and their role of honour, they do have another set of names that has been added after uh, their research has been complete. I'm quite confident with the 15 that we have here, uh, with the exception of three where we can't find any information at all, uh, we have not made a mistake in identifying these people for removal. But I do expect that as time goes on and more information becomes available, there will be other names that we're not made aware of yet that need to be added. So if I could just butt in there, uh, so are you suggesting that when we have the, the plaques, Somewhere along the line, built into the thing will be a supplementary plaque, because I can't believe we've got a thousand names we haven't got a mistake or two. Um, so we somehow we could build in a supplementary plaque, and if any of these 15 have been taken off the roll, and we find subsequently that they actually shouldn't have been taken off, they could perhaps go onto that supplementary. Plaque. That's correct. All right. Would that make you happy? That would make me really happy. Okay. Um, and, and on that basis, I'd be really happy to approve the removal of the 15 as recommended, knowing that if we have made a mistake, well, they could be reinstated. Just advice, I guess, from you, Mr Mayor, as to whether that needs to be a Part C addition to this or whether it is noted in the minutes of this meeting? I, I think it's noted in this, minute, in, in this meeting that we expect there will be, in the design, a supplementary plaque for any additions or alterations be made. Uh, Mr. Yes, Your Worship, I noticed on my trip to Europe last year that many memorials also um, recognised the people that survived the war, that served, and one of note was the uh, memorial to the Scottish commandos in the Highlands, where the uh, beautiful sculpture, which is, you know, internationally recognised bronze, it had those that were lost, but it also had a a garden um, memorial where people left flowers and notes for people that had passed on but had later but had served and we're linking the lower lawn with artwork and maybe that lower lawn could be used for people that they may have lost someone in action someone like in our family that survived but there were, there were opportunities with your artwork and your lower lawn to acknowledge both those that died in action and those that served and consequently have deceased. Do we have, do we have any idea in numbers? <sighs> like people with a connection to Hawke's Bay that have served in all forms of conflict? No, we don't, and it would be quite an effort to gather those numbers that's not being done to date. Just enormous. Uh, enormous. On average, across, across New Zealand, with civic roles of honour of this nature, uh, you could expect that that number is about 20%, 10 to 20% of the total that went overseas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so 1,000, it's, it's 10,000 or 20,000. That's right. But you wish, if I just might comment, there's no need to name them, just provide an area for contemplation and where you yeah. can leave something. That's well, I think the, the design needed. brief actually specifically yeah. talks about all that. It's all that needed. Yeah. All right, so you're happy now? I am happy, thank you. I'm but pleased. Thank you, Charles. I'm pleased. So, do we have a mover and second we've got there for you? Oh, no, no. no. Oh. oh, yes. So, so, do we have a mover? It's actually moved by Councillor Haig. And... and Seconded by. Oh yeah, yeah, we're still going through all this. Yes, yes. So that was the War Memorial Roll of Honour. Now the next one's the War Memorial Design, which we have covered already and, and voted on. The next one is the Greendale Pool funding decision. Can I speak to that? Yes, you can. Sir. Go for it. <laughs> Last time I spoke against um, the proposal, today I'm going to support the motion. It's obvious uh, now to me that our new pool design is not going to be big enough for Napier or Napier in the future. 
So I now support um, keeping or, or helping to fund the Taradale pool. I do find it interesting though that NCC is supporting a pool that is 72 years old. I say give or take there, Keith, because my maths might be out. 72 years old and demolishing the Ivan Wilson pool that is only 20 years old. If the, if the, and I'd just like to point out, if the Taradale pool um, doesn't reopen, I strongly recommend that the uh, Greendale Swim Club starts talks with uh, the Napier City Council on how it can get its share of pool space because um, from what I see, the maths isn't going to work. If Aquahawks get uh, seven lanes and the public get three and Greendale wants seven lanes as well, someone's going to have to do some uh, pretty stunning maths. I, I just pointed out, you say, well, from what you've seen the design, I haven't seen the final design. Am I the only one that's missed out? No. Uh, uh, we, haven't, we, we haven't seen the final design. See it next week at a workshop. All right. So the next item is road stopping corner of Geddes and Longfellow Avenue. That's Omani Refuse Landfill Joint Committee minutes for the seventh of December two thousand and eighteen. Moved by Councillor Price, seconded by Councillor Haig. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against carried. Um, the reports from the Regulatory Committee, which is the Napier City Council and the Napier City Business Employment Events for 2019. Moved by Councillor Price, seconded by Councillor White, Wright. Sorry. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. That's right, there's no panic, she's remembered the rock melon. Um, so we now move on to reports under delegated authority. Um, and so we have tenders let, and we have to take these, I'm told, separately, not all at once. So we have tenders let, moved by Councillor Taylor, seconded by Councillor Wright. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. Next item is resource consents. Moved by Councillor Dallymore, seconded by Councillor Haig. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. The next one is the documents executed under seal. I'll move that from the chair, seeing I actually sign them most of the time. Second by Councillor Dallymore. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. And the next one is the official information requests. Moved by Councillor Taylor, seconded by Councillor Jeffrey. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Could we have a motion to exclude the public, please? Aye. Uh, 